Next, from Chicago, we attend a panel discussion at the City Club of Chicago featuring Illinois Supreme Court Justice Ann Burke titled Juvenile Justice in Cook County, The View from Inside. This runs about one hour. Thank you so much, Jay, uh, for that wonderful <clears throat> introduction. And of course, with all the numbers and the dates, then you all know how old I am, so that's pretty <laughs> disgusting. Thanks, Jay. But on behalf of the panel, who are also devoted public servants, I want to thank all of you for attending today, and to the City Club especially, and the Board of the City Club, for making sure that this uh, topic is one in which that you are interested in and that you're going to hear from the best of the best. So, as you know, the criminal justice system is extremely complex. So today we're going to focus on the juvenile justice system, and I've prepared and simplified flowchart of the system in Cook County. There it is. Even that is still quite complex, which is something worth noting. Even those who are part of the system can't figure it out. So what we've done is we've prepared a more simplified chart and outlined in red is where each of the panelists today are exercising their particular leaderships. So let's turn to the panel. Judge Colleen Sheehan. Judge Colleen Sheehan was elected as a Cook County Circuit Judge in 2000. She is currently assigned at large to a Juvenile Justice Division calendar in Chicago. Judge Sheehan serves on the Illinois Supreme Court Juvenile Justice Committee and the Illinois Juvenile Justice Leadership Council. Recently, Judge Sheehan was appointed to the Board of Trustees of the Illinois Judicial College. She has developed many restorative justice programs including Bridging the Divide, which helps to facilitate and authenticate communication between police and the community. And currently, Judge Sheehan has developed and will implement a plan for the creation of a restorative justice community court over which she will preside. And when I say community court, it is truly in the community, and she'll tell you where it is. This particular initiative is funded by a Justice Department grant to restore relationships between nonviolent offenders and their victims. The next panelist is Leonard Dixon, and he is currently the superintendent of the Cook County Juvenile Temporary Detention Center, the JTDC, effective February 9, 2015. He is responsible for the administration and the management of all operations of the JTDC, including custody, medical, mental health services, social services, fiscal services, maintenance services, human resources, labor, labor relations, and other services and has an operating budget of $53.3 million and a staff of over 700. Superintendent Dixon's career in juvenile justice is recognized nationally, and he has been nationally recognized as an authority in delinquent residential care, case management, and detention. He is also recognized by the federal government as an expert in dealing with high-profile incidents. He was a member of the Dade County Black Family Symposium Committee, member of the American Correctional Association, member of Teaching Rehabilitation Youth, Boy Scouts of America, National Juvenile Detention Associations, the NJDA, and the National Committee on Assessment of Minority Children. In addition, Superintendent Dixon was on the board of directors of the Michigan Juvenile Detention Associations and he has also served as chairman of the Critical Issues Committee and president-elect for the National Juvenile Detention Association. Also, Superintendent Dixon was appointed by the president of the American Correctional Association to serve on the Standards Committee and a member of the ACA Disproportionate Minority Confinement Task Force. He has also testified before the United States Senate and House on Juvenile Justice Issues in addition to giving numerous speeches around the country on juvenile justice issues, he has presented at universities in Beijing and Shanghai, China. In February of 2006, <coughs> Superintendent Dixon was featured in Ebony Magazine as the president 
for the National Juvenile Detention Association. We also have Dr. Candace Jones. Dr. Jones was appointed as the director of the Illinois Department of Juvenile Justice in 2014 to lead critical reforms to the state's juvenile justice landscape, making communities safer by fostering a better life and outcomes for youth in custody. Dr. Jones has just resigned from her position and we will truly miss her. <laughs> Dr. Jones has led efforts to right-size the IDJJ by reducing the use of secure custody for low-risk youth and ensuring that high-risk youth who are placed in custody receive the services they need to successfully re-enter their communities. And under her leadership, the population of the IDJJ's youth facilities has decreased by 36% in all-time low. In 2015, Dr. Jones assembled, yes, my great. And in 2015, Dr. Jones assembled a coalition of juvenile justice advocates to develop a legislative reform package that was later signed into law by Illinois Governor Bruce Rauner. The laws helped the IDJJ continue to right size by excluding youth convicted of misdemeanors from being sentenced to the IDJJ, clarifying the length of community supervision, eliminating automatic transfers from juvenile court to adult court of 15-year-olds accused of certain crimes, and prohibiting children under 13 from being held in county detention unless there is no viable community-based alternative. Dr. Jones's career has been dedicated to public service centering on transforming systems to improve the quality of life for at-risk children. In 2012, she was named a White House Fellow. Her fellowship focused on developing a strategy for improving correctional education and re-entry services for incarcerated youth and adults. Her work resulted in the Department of Education's decision to issue a redetermination of Pell Grant eligibility for justice-involved youth and adults. That alone is fantastic. <laughs> and that marked a pivotal shift in making opportunities available for the formerly incarcerated. In addition, Dr. Jones drove juvenile justice strategy nationally as a program officer at the MacArthur Foundation. And while at MacArthur, she led the partnerships that enabled the state and local institutions to create methods and programs that juvenile justice professionals now look to as best practices in areas including the development of graduated sanctions, use of risk assessment instruments, and vocational programming. And so now we're going to turn to our panelists. As you can see from the flow chart, which is so easy to read, um, <laughs> the court does play a central role in the juvenile justice process. The judge decides if a youth goes to detention or goes home. Now Judge Sheehan is one of our talented and committed judges assigned to juvenile court. And I should note that Cook County uh, led the, nas the nation in creating the first juvenile court in over 100 years, prompted by Jane Addams' view that juveniles should be treated differently from adults in the justice system. Judge Sheehan, you are working on an extremely innovative initiative. It is innovated for two reasons, the structure and type of court you are creating and the age group in which you are focusing. Could you please explain both of these outstanding initiatives and what they are intended to accomplish? Also, please include the relationship between your work and the city violence. Judge Sheehan. Thank you, Justice Burke, um, for your kind introduction. And thank you to the City Club for hosting this wonderful event for all of you to attending. Um, let me just say it's an honor to be on this panel with uh, two um, such esteemed uh, juvenile justice professionals. I'm very excited and happy to be here. The Circuit Court of Cook County uh, is implementing a court that is the first of its kind. It's never been uh, done in the, in the country before and I don't think even the world. 
under the direction of uh, the, the birthday boy, uh, Chief Justice uh, uh, Evans, uh, Cook County is creating a restorative justice community court. This uh, court will be located in the community and it will use the restorative justice philosophy. It will serve the emerging adults ages 18 to 26 who have been charged with a nonviolent felony or misdemeanor. And the location of this community court will be in North Lawndale. North Lawndale is a community uh, second in violence only to Inglewood. And although they have, are plagued with uh, problems, they are a strong community and they do have a very strong restorative justice hub and they have been working with this population for some time. So just briefly, what is restorative justice? Restorative justice, really at the core of it, is an authentic uh, way to foster communi authentic communication. It uh, really seeks to repair the harm from crime. It focuses less on sort of a punitive or accountability to the state and really looks to repair the harm from crime. The people that are involved in that repair are the defendant, the victim, and the community, and that's a very important concept, that the community will be involved, and others who are directly affected by that crime. The process must be a voluntary process. You can't just throw people into this process. The defendant has to agree to be a part of this process. The victim has to agree to be a part of this process. And the defendant has to say, yes, I did commit a crime, I did cause harm, and then also has to say, I would like a way to repair that harm from crime, to make the victim as whole as possible. Now, how does a restorative justice community court work? There's a lot of things that we're working out and this next year we'll be uh, ironing out the, the sort of the nuts and bolts of it. But basically how it works is once a case is deemed to be appropriate for this court, the defendant would come in, they would be referred to the community to participate in what's called a peace circle, and that is a practice of restorative justice. A peace circle is just what it sounds like, a circle. There is a facilitator, a trained facilitator, that would be held within the community in a safe space where the victim and the defendant and the community members would get to know each other. They would, the victim would have real meaningful input as to uh, what the harm was to the victim and how best to make this victim whole. But there would also be accountability from the community to the defendant. How was it that this young person became involved in this crime? What's going on in their life? Are, is there substance abuse issues, mental health issues? Do they, have they not finished their education? So the community would offer services and mentorship to this young person to integrate them back into the community in the most positive of way. Once the circle or circles were completed, the result of that circle would be reported back to the court and the court would monitor that and to make sure that what everyone said they were going to do was done. Uh, if they participate in this program, the defendants participate in this program, they complete it successfully, there would be an opportunity for their case to be dismissed or for their judgment of guilty to be vacated. Now, it's innovative for, I think, uh, just a, a couple of reasons. It allows actually for community input and victim input in a way that might not be possible in a regular court setting. It marshals the talent and resources of the community and uses the strength of the court so there can be true collaboration to solve the issues that are in some of these communities. It also lowers incarceration rate and conviction rate. In North Lawndale, the community that Judge Evans uh, picked for this court to happen. Seven out of ten young men in North Lawndale have felony convictions. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to know what that could do to a community. I think it also repairs the relationship with the system in the community. There's certainly some distrust that the community has with its institutions, and this would go away to doing that. I just want to say one final thing about juvenile court and how this relates to juvenile court. I think the bulk of the restorative justice work that's been done in the city of Chicago and the county of Cook really came from working with that juvenile population. And I think that there, uh, if you sit in juvenile court like I do, 
you cannot witness the devastation of violence, of mental health, substance abuse, poverty. And like my colleague, uh, Stuart Katz over there, who go into a courtroom on Thursday, see a smiling young person, know that they're on their way, come to work on Monday and hear that they've been killed. It makes you feel like you need to do more. Uh, the restorative justice community court, I think, is an answer how we can do more. I don't think it could happen just because we said, hey, let's create this restorative justice community court. Juvenile court has allowed, and under the direction of uh, presiding Judge Michael Tooman, and I can speak personally from this, he has supported any of the initiatives that I wanted to develop or help create. For example, like Bridging the Divide, which seeks to have police and youth together in a safe space. That he allowed uh, me to collaborate with my friends here from the YMCA they, uh, and the Chicago Police Department to look at that relationship to make our community safer. Uh, I'm really excited about uh, this program. There's a lot of uh, uh, things to iron out, but I think the core of it and the heart of it is, can we do more? Should we do more? And I believe that the Restorative Justice Community Court is that answer. And while you're sitting there thinking about what we can do, do more and to help Judge Sheehan, um, write down some questions that you have of her and maybe some suggestions what you can do to help. And now um, I'm looking uh, to Superintendent Dixon. After a youth is arrested, if it is determined that he or she needs to be detained before trial, that youth becomes the responsibility of Superintendent Leonard Dixon who runs the Cook County Juvenile Temporary Detention Center, which we used to call the Audi Home. Some of us are old enough to remember that. S Superintendent Dixon, almost a year ago, you were hired to oversee the detention center. Following the ruling by the United States District Court that the supervision of the detention center was to transfer from federal oversight to the oversight of the office of the Chief Circuit Court Judge. And fortunately for us, you were chosen to be the superintendent. Superintendent Dixon, could you please describe for all of us who might not be familiar how many youth are presently in the facility, how long they stay on an average, and what the conditions were like when you became the superintendent. Then please talk about the changes you have made thus far and what outcomes you're trying to achieve for the youth also include, if you can, the relationship between your work and the city violence. It's a big topic. Okay. Come on. Yes, you are. Hell, that was longer than my resume. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you for having me here. Um, see how I start this. What will I do when you're gone? Who's gonna tell me the truth? Who's gonna finish the stories I start the way you always do? When somebody knocks at the door, someone else comes in. I will smile and take their hands, but you can't make old friends. And that's one of the things that we need from this group. See, when people ask me about what we need to do, my issue is, is that we are part of the community. And as we become friends and we work together, then we get things accomplished because no one does anything alone. My father was right. If you don't like or love people, you can't help them. And when you love and like people, then you spend time to help them become successful. And it doesn't make a difference what community that you're in. Now, one of the things that I want to do with you, because of course a lot of people have not worked in juvenile justice, so let me give you something that you can remember. I'd like for you to think of juvenile detention 
as the emergency room of the juvenile justice system. And I'm going to give you a mnemonic way, a mnemonic way of understanding that. If you have a pen, this is my education piece coming in, you can write this down. <laughs> write the word chapters, like chapters in a book, and understand it like this. Classification, health and mental health, access of how we work with parents and courts and attorneys, programming, how we set up programs, you know, for kids, training, how do we train folks, environment, what kind of environment that you put people in. Restraints, how do we do it in a humane way because we have difficult kids? And safety, how safe is your environment? Those are the concepts that we're using to work with our kids and work with our staff. Because we have a lot of kids who have been traumatized, right? But what we don't understand about trauma is that some of that trauma makes them resilient because you can't fix what already has happened sometimes. But the other piece of that is helping our staff because if our staff don't understand what's going on with our kids, then how are they supposed to work with them? So I'm a firm believer in having our staff understand what's going on, which transfers down to the kids. It's been interesting since I've been here. People ask me this question all the time, well, Oh man, isn't that a, that's a tough job. And I'm like, oh hell no, I'm having fun. <laughs> and one of the reasons is because I've been doing it for almost 40 years. And I'm a firm believer if you like what you do, then you're having fun at it. And I engage my kids. And I call them my kids because they have to go back in that community and they have to go back into some tough places. And most people don't have a clue or have an understanding of what they have to go back to. That's why when you make friends, you do get an understanding. Because once you become a friend of someone, that means that you engage them. And one of the things in my vision for that facility is that those kids will have friends and adult friends that they can trust and people that will engage them and work with them and help them be successful. A young man, I was talking to the judge earlier, and I do something that most superintendents don't. See, I spend a lot of time at the facility, midnights, evenings, weekends. And so this weekend, I was with kids. While everybody was barbecuing, I was with kids, which is fine. My wife let me out the house so I could go do it. <laughs> and I had one kid who asked me, Mr. Dixon, why do we have to go to bed at 7 o'clock? And I said, I care about you. One reason is because you've been running the streets for God knows how long. And I'm going to make sure that we do something with your body and going to feed you properly so you can grow. And you know where that comes from? Being in the system for a long time, and I watch kids, and if you pay attention to them, you can watch when they come into an institution because they have been out there running and doing and all those kinds of things, you can see their bodies start to change when they start getting rest. You can see their bodies start to change when their nutrition changes. Those are the kind of things that people don't pay attention to. One of the other things that we looked at was environment. And I talk to my staff all the time about it. The tone in your environment. When I first got there, I'm like, is this an emergency room for real? Because the ambulance was going on all the time and people were making noise and all this stuff going on. And my issue was, no, bring the tone down. And so we don't have all those calls and all those kind of things going on. And guess what? We looked at the data. I just looked at it the other day. When I first got there, I think last year this time, we looked at the data and there were um, a couple of hundred you know, assaults on staff, right? Because it's a tough environment. I tell people all the time, 
You show me a school that don't have altercations, I'll show you one that's not open. That's what kids do. The issue is, is how do we respond to it? How do we put an environment so that stuff is reduced? And that's how it works, okay? We look at the data this year, some of the things we put in place, it's dropped by 46%. You know what that does? You know what that does? That means that what we're doing from a mental health standpoint, from an education standpoint, from a medical standpoint, we're working with the state, with Candace and those, and putting you know, case management together with the probation department, which had not been done before. That means that everybody's talking. And when everybody's talking, they're communicating, and they're getting things together so we can actually put a good plan together for kids. And don't get me wrong, they're not supposed to be there that long. People call it the Audi home. And I, you know, I heard that from reading in the books and all that. That's almost like one-on-one, you know, uh, juvenile justice stuff. Well, in Wayne County, they used to call it the youth home. And when we took over, we changed the name to the Wayne County Juvenile Detention Facility. And the reason why it is because names have meanings, because kids are not supposed to be there a long time. It's not supposed to be their home. If it's their home, then we have a bigger problem than what we imagine. Because once you put people in, once you incarcerate people, the longer you keep them in, actually the worse they get. Because they become institutionalized. Our job is to figure out ways to move kids through the system and get them where they need to go. And so if you look at it from an emergency room concept, when you hurt yourself or you break your leg or your ankle or whatever, they don't keep you in the emergency room. They send you where you need to go so you can get services. That's the way it works. And if we have that concept in our system, that means that we'll find ways to reduce kids coming into the system because that's, that is what we're supposed to be doing. That is if you care. One of the things, other things, and I'll sit down, is we never like to talk about race. We never like to talk about the significance of what goes on from a racial component. Well, as I go around this country, I see a lot. And I ask the question sometimes, why is there so many minority kids in the juvenile justice system? Those are the questions that we need to be asking. Because once we engage each other and become friends, guess what? We can reduce some of the violence and some of the things that's going on. Because whether we realize it or not, it's not a black and white issue. It's an us issue. And when we work on those kind of things, then that's how we resolve some of those issues. Because when you think you're in your neighborhood and it's not going to affect you, it does. And what we're trying to do is say we're going to work with kids the best we can, and we want to engage, we want to friends, and we need to take this community, and this community needs to become a friend. And it needs to become a friend to all kids. And when we do that, then we don't have to worry about looking at the news all the time and all the violence that's going on, because we're engaged and it's going to help us be better. Because my kids and my grandkids have to be out there also. And I want them to be safe. So my issue is what we do there is the mental health, the educational, the behavior management systems of teaching kids, this is how you respond to things. Did you count before you do, do, did some stuff? Did you think about what you were doing? And finally, I'm a firm believer that Men have a very, very, very significant role in what's going on. And I'm a firm believer that as a black male, I have a responsibility to make sure that I engage them in every way I can. And that's what we're setting up at that detention center, okay? Is that we will engage them. We will not stand off from them. We will not spend time talking at them. We're going to talk to them. And we're going to help them be successful. And the reason I can figure that out is because I'm on the units with them a lot of times, because I'm not the kind of superintendent that sits in the office. I didn't do that wherever I went. 
and I've learned from a lot of good people that when you engage people, you get things done. That was my mother and that was my father's response to us. And I had a very successful family. But the issue is, is that we, was, we were taught that we had to give back. Because when you raise on a farm like I was, the hat is not urban cowboy. It's real because that's what I was raised. And that raising had to do with how you engage people, how you took people, and you helped them everywhere you can because it was just you. And you had to depend on other people to do things. So that's what we're teaching there at that juvenile detention facility. <laughs> Thank you, Superintendent. Uh, for more than two years, Can Director Candace Jones has led the Department of Juvenile Justice at state level agency where youth are sent when they are convicted of a crime. Under her leadership, the population of the six youth facilities in Illinois has decreased from 1,200 to approximately 400. Now, Dr. Jones, could you please explain how and why that happened? What are you trying to accomplish for our youth? And how did you begin that process? And also, please include the relationship between your work and city violence, if you can. Sure, thank you. I want to thank the panelists and, of course, Justice Burke. Um, I can't take credit for all that. Uh, Justice Burke's number is that the population of youth in custody has declined from a little over 1,200 in the last five years. All of that was not me. When I came on, we had 810 youth in custody. We have 400 today. I take credit for that. And some people, well, be careful. Before you start lighting candles, there's as many people who would throw a dart at my picture, um, which I think is healthy. Uh, but I do actually want to talk about this correlation between justice policy and reform and youth violence, because I think it's a real, we got to deal with that in Illinois, in Chicago. I'm from here, I'll say. I grew up not that far from North Lawndale, Chicago Avenue and Cicero, and I live in just a regular working class community in Chicago, which I always thought was important. When I moved back to DC to do justice policy here, someone who I've known and worked with for a long time called me and said, why are you, why are you doing that? this is not the easiest place to do justice work. And I said, it's true. You know, God knows right? we paid better and work less in another jurisdiction. Uh, but sh Chicago's my home and Illinois is my home. And we gotta get this right, right? What we need to pay attention to and what I think I've tried to work on in the last couple of years is this conversation in Illinois which needs to happen and in Chicago about what works. We know better now as a nation and we need to do better, right? What's going on in the streets of Chicago? We are evidencing in our investments, in our education system, in our policy, we don't care about these kids. What are they doing? They turn around and saying, they don't care either. And they dying for it, and they're killing other people for it. The result of that doesn't make them monsters, right? If we all lifted up a mirror, we have to take responsibility for that. The thing I looked at when I came on at the Department of Juvenile Justice is a couple of things. One, the per capita keep a child with me for a year is $130,000. I didn't have an $130,000 undergraduate degree. That's a lot of money that we spend to lock kids up after we've done a whole lot of not good things up until that point. You don't go to an emergency room to get good care. You go there when the last resort is all that you have. And too many people without good health care go there because they have no other option. And essentially, systemically, that's what we're doing to our children. They got a mental health problem, put them in custody. They got an IEP education problem, put them in custody. We can't figure out how to get them what they need in their community, put them in custody. That's not right. So I focused a lot on two big buckets when I came to the state. Who ends up in the system, which most people would argue wasn't really my job. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other part, which is what you do when they get there, because we have a responsibility to teach them some things and try to get them back on track when we have them. But I took it very personally, this idea that I needed to also take responsibility for the question of who ended up there. If you are putting misdemeanors, low-risk, non-violent youth in custody with older kids who have been through the system many times and are therefore more serious charges, 
not necessarily higher risk, I'll come back to that in a second, but who may be there multiple times and for more serious charges, do you think that the likelihood is that this younger kid is gonna go back and jump right back on track? No. You're increasing the likelihood that those youth will fail in the future. We have to take responsibility as a system, and I tell people this all the time. We say, okay, I'm gonna do this to this child, and later when they failed, I knew it was in him. I knew he, was, he had the capacity to fail. When the truth is we take no responsibility for the idea is that we made choices that accelerated the likelihood that that youth would end up exactly where they end up. We did it. And that's a problem. We didn't do it alone. They make volitional acts. They have to take responsibility. But frankly, as adult and policymakers, so do we. We have to stop responding and then responding poorly. There are some youth for whom incapacitation is the appropriate response, but it is a very small population of youth. And if we continue to drive hordes and hordes of children into the system, we, one, will increase the likelihood that some of those youth will fail when they otherwise wouldn't have. We also thin out already too precious resources to be able to really watch and respond to those youth that are high risk because we're looking at everybody just the same. It's a little bit of a policy mess. And so I've spent the last couple of years really trying to focus on that, both forcing this conversation about who's going in and then at the same time looking at what we're doing to those that come out. I agree, we have a fundamental responsibility. I run six, very soon five, Illinois prisons. And we have some responsibility to talk about what we're doing with the youth that come into custody. But by and large, research has shown and shown for a very long time now that incapacitation increases the likelihood of future recidivism and failure. So we had better stop leaping so quickly to that reaction. It's a dangerous game we're playing and we're doing it to ourselves. I now have a few uh, general questions I'd like the panelists to respond to briefly. Um, with re following up on what Dr. Jones said, um, we do spend a considerable, considerable amount of time and money in this system on our youth. And how do we know if we are achieving the positive outcome? Uh, who follows? Who is in charge of following the outcomes for these youth to assess if good things are happening to yeah. them? And how do we um, save them? Thank you. We track, uh, in the state of Illinois, we track recidivism. We track it at the local level. I mean, the sort of nice science about recidivism, it's like the masterful game of policy making, right? It's the easiest place to cook the books because recidivism is as simple as what you put into the equation, right? My recidivism might not be his recidivism because we're all defining the numbers differently. I mean, one thing that we need to think about is whether or not we need to have a uniform policy so that we're having one conversation. But basically what we usually track in justice system is the rate of failure of individuals coming out of custody or coming off supervision of some sort. I run the prisons and post-release supervision. What we have not and do not usually do is track what are called positive youth outcomes. We haven't given a lot of lip service to whether or not we care for all those individuals who do make it, what cocktail of factors help. Did they get back in school? Did they get quality substance abuse programming? Did they get housing? What really starts to wrap around a person to make it work? We just haven't dedicated a lot of resources to that because we give so much attention to recidivism. We need to track recidivism, we need to track failure, but systemically we have to start looking looking at those other things that do work so that we can get a handle on how we make investments and do a good job there. Our system does, because we do post-release supervision, has started to track some of the things, education engagement, job and workforce engagement, uh, not just referral to, but actually whether or not there was connection to and follow through with services and treatment. So we can start to understand all the factors that make up you know, a child. I mean, the interesting thing is that if any of us had a child, and lots of people do, or even were a child, the fact that you didn't go out and sort of uh, get high again or shoplift a bag of potato chips 
would not be the only measure of success for you. As parents, as individuals, what you care about is that your child got a job, that they're self-sustaining, that they're healthy, that they're able to support themselves, pay taxes, and be a contributing citizen. But for people who end up in the justice system, the standards of what we consider sort of baseline uh, acceptability are so low. And so because of that, a lot of times the results are so low. So I think you know it's one of the reasons why Pell and investment in school and workforce is so important because we actually have to care if you want to have sustained citizens, you got to put something in them. Judge Sheehan, with regard to that same question and the court system tracking the young people, I know that you see them uh, one time and then you might see them again, but could you please expound on that? Sure. I think uh, one of the things that juvenile court ha has done uh, in the last, I think, few years is the juvenile court probation has uh, created data and shared that data with the judges with regard to the warrants that they issue, with regard to the detention, uh, a number of uh, detention commitments that they make, with regard to the number of of minors that they send to the Illinois Department of Juvenile Justice or whether they send them to an intensive probation department. I, we, we share the, this data with, uh, we get the data per the calendar, we get them at the monthly uh, meetings that we have in juvenile court, and when that data comes out, we all get a folder. And what's interesting to see what happens is all the judges start looking at it, it's like, hey, how many did you send over there? And we really begin to compare with each other, and I can say for myself, it has made me reflect mm -hmm. Uh, wow, that number is a little higher than I would have thought, or the next month, okay, I, I, I got that number down. Um, I spoke, so, so that I think has been very beneficial to have that a actual data in black and white from calendar to calendar, on a graph from year to year, you can see it, so you can really take a look at that. That will reflect, you know, recidivism, you know, I, I know the numbers, it can, not, I don't want to use the word cooked, but um, but I had a conversation this morning with the acting director of juvenile probation, Avak Das, and I said, are we measuring uh, the things like the director Candace Jones talked about, you know, and it's, it's some things do not lend themselves well to a graph. Um, and so I think just as we're doing some innovative things like the Restorative Justice Community Court, we have to figure out innovative ways to measure things like, do I feel safe? Am I happy? Am I, am I, am I getting back into school? Um, you know, how, how am I uh, engaging with the community? Is the community safer? Uh, I think that we have to figure out a way to measure that and then share that as well. Uh, one of the things he talked about was um, the work that they're doing with the community, the restorative justice work that they're doing, creating a newsletter. I mean, not everything can go on a graph. Um, and so, uh, I, I think getting those numbers is really important, but I also think to putting the time and the energy and the thought into measuring things um, aside from just are they in custody or not. Superintendent Dixon, do you have any thoughts on this? I'm sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how to, to, say, to say this. You're among friends. You can just say <laughs> Doing this as long as I have, I've come to the conclusion that a lot of times we spend a lot of time in data and not really asking the right question. And the right question we should be asking is why they come to us in the first place. And what are we doing to try to reduce that? Because, you know, we're talking human beings. And my old man was totally correct when he said human beings are what they are, son, human beings. And you do things and, you know, you, you try to figure out how you, you, you help somebody. But we know for a fact, and it's not something that we got to guess, that the relationship between economics and communities are what drives crime. 
Well, if we know that, it seems to me, and you know, again, I'm just a country boy and, you know, we kind of slow, <laughs> you know. But it appears to me that if, if we know that there's an issue of economics that's involved with this, then kids working and those old people who I love dearly was right. And they didn't have to go to school to determine that an idle mind is the devil's workshop. That was real simple, you know, kind of stuff. And I think we made it more sophisticated because I think we have some folks and we talk about cook the books and those kind of things, and I, I'm sure I get in trouble. That folks who think that it's okay to have our young people locked up because they don't know what else to do with them. And I keep saying that being in this system for as long as I have and seeing what I have seen at all levels is that I want to figure out why they're coming in, not that they're in our system and what we're doing with them. Because I think if, if when I look at throughout this country and being on the, 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 the federal minority overrepresentation groups and you know all those kinds of things, that's the stuff that people talk about but in public don't like to talk about. And my issue is, is that I want to see the same concentration on those things as we do of folks being locked up. Because I think being locked up, then that's the easy way out. And if it's our kids, it's like the drug, you know, piece, you know, since we know that opiates and all those things are a problem now. When we look at it, now we're saying, well, we need to do something about that. But when it was crack cocaine and, and that kind of stuff, when that was all running, people didn't have the same um, empathy, you know, for it. And so we have to look at ourselves and see what we want to do to change this. Because if we don't have the empathy you know, for our kids, then nobody else will. And so we can talk about all the data. It, I had a friend that graduated, got her PhD from Harvard, you know, um, a couple, couple months ago, right? And her thesis had to do with uh, reentry, right? And so we were kicking it, talking, and she said, oh man, I, I, I got, this is what I see, Leonard, and, and reentry and all this. And I said, oh, that's wow. All I did was go back to my, my uh, book that I had in 1984. And I showed her the same thing that we talked about in 1984. <laughs> it's the same thing that she just did herself on. OK? So to me, if we're really concerned about solving the problem, then let's go solve the problem and not just keep using data and statistics. I think sometimes people use data and statistics to keep from doing things because they understand that if I do that, then I don't have to really deal with the real issue. I'm going to jump in here because I respect you enough to disagree violently. That is ridiculous. <laughs> That's, okay. That's okay. In Illinois in particular, we have ignored research. We do not make systems accountable for what they do, and that is a problem. Oh, I agree with that. This idea that I, I agree we shouldn't be idealizing any questions and doing nothing, but we have for too long trusted people's gut instincts. Mm -hmm. I came on to the system, the Department of Juvenile Justice in 2014, a system that ran prison for youth that did not have a risk assessment instrument, mm -hmm. something that has been a field practice for nearly a decade now. I, I appreciate uh, an adults and colorful stories as much as the next person, but the idea that system stakeholders, it should be okay for them to not be tracking, publishing, and accountable for their data and research is patently ridiculous to me. 
And I think as members of the policy community and leadership in this state, it should be unacceptable as a baseline. Mm -hmm. We need to know what's going on. We need to be tracking it and analyzing it, and we need to be making it available to everybody here also. I agree poverty is a problem. Race is a problem, and we need to talk about those things. But I think sometimes we use these hallmark issues to absolve each one of us are the responsibility to take credit for the system that we run. I may not be able to fix race tomorrow or poverty tomorrow, but I can damn sure change today what's going on in the Department of Juvenile Justice. And I think we have to be really careful about making the problem so big that we don't take responsibility for the part of that bag we hold. All of these things have an impact. But each one of these systems individually contribute to that. And they need to be accountable towards moving in the direction that we all have to go. So I just, I want to qualify what we say because I think it's important for us to be in the details because that stuff does matter. And it's something that I think hasn't had enough of a conversation here in Illinois. Well, I'm, I'm going to say this. You, you got to understand where I come from. I love debate. <laughs> because I think that's how you solve things. I don't have one iota of disagreement with what she said, not one. My point is, is that we've been doing it for so long, and we've seen the data. And I think I said that, that was my first statement, that we've seen the data. The data has not changed that much in the last, I've been doing it for almost 40 years. And so if we know that that's what the deal is, the question becomes, what are we doing to fix the problem? Because we keep looking at it as the kids getting into the system, and I keep saying, what are you doing before they get into the system? With regard to that, um, Superintendent Dixon, all of you have talked about um, being in the system. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a correlation in uh, the fact that many of the people who have come into the system have been in the system earlier in abuse and neglect? And do you think it would be um, helpful to have a unified juvenile justice system, Judge Sheehan? That's a big question. I know. <laughs> uh, thank you for giving me that question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm going to leave. Well, I, I think a lot of people need to weigh in on that. I mean, I think that in, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking at some of my colleagues over there. Some are shaking yes, some are shaking no. I think that there's yeah. people who, are, who, who would think that that would be a good idea and others who, who wouldn't. Um, as far as the a unified system, um, you know, I, I, would, I would have to study that more and have, have more information about that. But what I would say, though, is we would, should be working towards um, real authentic collaboration with each other because there's things that are going on over in child protection uh, that I hear about and you know it while it's only across the the building um, sometimes it, it seems as if those two worlds are are, are far apart um, and it, it there there are certainly um, children who started out in the uh, the child protection um, uh, side of the building who end up in the juvenile justice side of the building. Of course, the question really means, do we need to do more earlier on before they... I, definitely. I, I, absolutely. more resources. Absolutely. Yeah. We have, um, I've been told to cut it. <laughs> we have one question from the audience so far, Andrea Durbin. She's with the Illinois uh, Collaboration on Youth Pay Now Illinois. How does this failure of Illinois to pass a budget, keyword, and pay its bills impact juvenile justice reform in Cook County. We are seeing the evisceration of community and provides the help and prevent violence and address mental health issues. So um, with addiction and all the other things, I, I don't think that we need to hold dissertation on this, but I think quickly you could answer the questions in each a minute. Uh, just in a minute, with regard to you know saying we want to do work with bringing the community in, some of these smaller service providers count on those dollars from the state, and if, and if they're not a larger larger service provider, they're going to have to close up shop, and they will not be able to provide the services because they do not have the funds to keep providing the services. And when we're really talking about um, 
marshaling the talents of the community. It's those smaller service providers that, you know, that we, we, we're relying on. So I, that's obviously one way it affects it. Dr. Jones? We need a safety net. There's no question about it. If what we're trying to do is have, you know, more kids, less kids treated by the system and more kids treated locally, there has to be something locally for them. So if some fun point, everybody's going to have to come together so that we ensure that, um, or all of us are going to have to be hosting this lunch in the rotunda of the Capitol. Superintendent? Ditto. Ditto, okay. <laughs> well, first...